Okay, thanks uh, for coming to the lecture today. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Tim Garrett from the University of Utah. Uh, Tim got his bachelor's in physics from the University of Waterloo uh, back in the 90s, and then uh, went to the University of Washington to do his PhD with Peter Hobbs. Um, I think uh, maybe the mid 90s, late 90s he defended? 2000. 2000. So, um, you know, some of us uh, get advice from adv our advisors to kind of stick with what you do best and stick with one thing and you'll have a successful career. Tim did not take that advice. Uh, his breadth of research is really quite impressive. Um, so Tim can build things. He can actually build instruments and has built successful instruments to measure snowflakes. He's been involved with field campaigns. Uh, he has interests spanning uh, theoretical problems and applications. Uh, he's interested in climate problems and weather problems, from the poles to the tropics, uh, from the smallest turbulent scales to global scales. He's even dabbled in economic theory and energy flows. Um, but I think, uh, his, according to him, his proudest moment was the discovery of a new cloud type called Mimatocumulus Luculus. And apparently, Luculus is a delicacy in the north of France, which is a layer of foie gras and smoked beef tongue. And it sounds really good. The clouds look like that, apparently. But the WMO didn't like the name, so it took a long time to get that to be official. So uh, without further ado, Tim, please, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, uh, Brian, and thanks everyone for coming out here. I know it's a poster day and you're probably all very busy and have other things to do after the poster session, but I, I think I should start off first by acknowledging Brian. Like, uh, I saw a presentation remotely where Brian was present on, along with Graham Stevens and Kate Marvel, and he gave this wonderful presentation about the work that's done on clouds and climate here, you know, how you can uh, diagnose clouds with uh, various wavelengths. and look at their properties and also look at long-term trends, fascinating work. But I think the most interesting thing was in the question period where there was a, a question from the audience um, looking for some expertise on uh, chemtrails. And um, I think the, the main thing that st uh, stood out for me was that Kate uh, Marvel and Graham Stevens immediately pointed at Brian <laughs> as being the JPL expert on this uh, conspiracy theory of uh, phenomenon. So anyway, he did very well, I thought. So I, I'm gonna talk about um, some ideas I've been playing with um, about cloud, cloud dynamics and uh, tropics. Um, but you know, just to start off, just provide some historical context. You know, this is a bit uh, stimulated by some conversations with uh, Joao, but it got me thinking about where weather modeling, numerical modeling came from, and then you know, they're really some of the origins I came from with both Burtonese, Burtonese and uh, Lewis Fry Richardson in his underappreciated work at that time in 1922, numerical weather prediction, weather prediction by numerical processes, um, where he imagined um, creating a grid and having measurements in a grid uh, from weather stations and then doing computations to make a forecast for the future that would um, be able to be done faster than the weather would actually arrive. And this is, is part of his re, uh, vision for, this was something called the weather forecast factory, where he you know, imagined that he would take about 64,000 people in this weather forecast factory to make a prediction that fast. And in fact, that was probably an underestimate. It may have been closer to a million people would be necessary. Remember, this is before the age of computing, um, but nonetheless, he made his own attempt and he came up with a six hour forecast for the pressure tendency of 146 millibars. So he wasn't able to do this very successfully. But nonetheless, he had this dream, and this was a very important dream, of course, and the dream was that perhaps someday in the dim future it will be possible to advance the computations faster than the weather advances and it'll cost less than the savings to mankind due to the information gained. So that is a dream. And of course, that dream's been successfully realized. Weather forecasts now are you know, tremendously good many days in advance, and they happen very quickly. Now, when we think about climate, um, well, let's take the most basic climate parameter, which is the climate sensitivity. 
which is the equilibrium global temperature response to a doubling of CO2 concentrations. And there I think maybe the history is um, a little less positive. I mean, we have this Charney report in 1979, which predicts a climate sensitivity of 1.5 degrees Celsius to 4.5 degrees Celsius. And as we go through the various IPCC reports, well, really, that prediction has not changed. I mean, that's a factor of three difference in that range, and then there are more extreme values that are considered as well. And of course, since 1979, climate has changed. So I'm not sure that we are realizing this. I mean, this is perhaps being a bit provocative, but I'm saying perhaps someday in the dim future, it will be possible to advance the computations faster than climate advances, and at a cost less than the saving to mankind due to the information gained. But that is a dream. So I mean, of course, you know, why is this so hard? And I think you know, the reason is, is that the cloud feedbacks are difficult to constrain. If we look at the various feedbacks in the climate system, the water vapor and long, um, the lapse rate feedback is well constrained, the albedo is relatively small, but then the cloud feedbacks, even expressed as a somewhat canceling long wave cloud feedback and short wave cloud feedback, they are a bit all over the map. And they are the primary thing that contributes to the equilibrium climate sensitivity shown on the right. So this is the target that we want to focus on. But of course, the challenge is that, you know, if we look at something like this, we are faced with phenomenal complexity. This isn't like a clear sky um, water vapor field that might vary over synoptic scales. Here we have tremendous variability over scales of well, even down to millimeters, or even if you look at ice crystals at the mesoscopic scale, the roughness of an ice crystal has important uh, impacts on climate. So we have this extraordinary level of detail that makes this problem hard. And of course, this is where the parameterizations come in. We want to try to parameterize this sort of detail um, suitably so that it can be used in the GCM in a way that can improve the forecast, and, I, and we have been doing that. And that's just the thing, is that even though we have been doing that, and we've had tremendous advances in computational skill and physical understanding, the climate sensitivity is not narrowing. So that's a bit curious. But the approach we use is to do detailed numerical simulations. So this is the Giga LES, which was a simulation done about 10 years ago, but it's um, a billion grid points calculated every two seconds um, over 24 hours. It was about 12 hour spin up and then 12 hour um, quasi equilibrium simulation time. And you know, to here we're just looking at you know, a cloud field um, just for a small fraction of this time period. And you know, the Giga LES is a great tool for sort of developing some sort of intuitive understanding of how complex tropical cloud fields evolve. This is where we took um, Ian Glenn as actually as part of a, um, a radiative transfer class I was teaching, the class project he did was he passed the Giga LES through SHDOM to create a 3D radiative transfer simulation of what the clouds would look like. And you can see here that you know, the Giga LES produces something that looks you know, astonishingly realistic. Um, so you know, we might have some reason to believe that this is a useful tool for trying to understand what clouds are actually doing. And in fact, we can even go a step further and uh, actually say, well, we have got particular kinds of ice crystals in the model and then do the SHDOM uh, realization at really quite fine angles with many streams and get such things as halos. In fact, there's a 46 degree halo in this too, which, well, you can just see a little bit of color down there. But, so, you know, you might look at this and think, okay, so the, the, this model is doing pretty well. And so if we want to use this as a tool for um, developing parameterizations, then maybe this is, this is useful. And, but of course, the sacrifice is that this comes at tremendous computational expense. You know, we have, well, you know, lots of equations that go into each one of those billion cells. And we have to run it every two 
seconds, and you know, it's, it's complicated. Of course, uh, it, this is a large computational expense to do, do this sort of thing. But then I want to come back to something basic, which is that if we look at a tropical cloud field, you know that's a tropical cloud field in, in, in a moment. You don't have to do any analysis to know that's a tropical cloud field. Your brain is doing something to recognize that this is a tropical cloud field. So, well, what is your brain doing? And I think one part of this is, well, you see maybe one big cloud. That's a cirrus anvil in this scene and lots of little small clouds. And that might be different, like if you were looking at uh, mid-latitudes as a stratus cloud field, you might see something that's a different pattern and that would immediately tell you that this was a stratus cloud field. But your brain would do that instantly and one could look you know, at a different picture. This is a different case. But again, you know instantly this is somewhat similar. So I think you know, this brings up the question, is Richardson's approach really the best one to be approaching the cloud climate problem? Do we want to model clouds in a deterministic fashion? It does not appear to be working out particularly well for us. Is there perhaps a statistical approach that may be better? And this was a question when Joao came to uh, the University of Utah. He raised this question, really, you know, is the best way to model clouds for climate models deterministically like weather models? Why do we model climate deterministically like uh, Richardson uh, dreamed of? So I think, you know, maybe an analog here is to say, well, so I didn't have, I'm not very artistic, but let's say you imagine you have two kids on a seesaw. And you know, the kids weigh the same and it's just a regular seesaw and they're going up and down, right? And you can imagine modeling this deterministically. And with ever successive scales of complexity, you might you know, do not just the dynamics of the, you know, the, the seesaw itself, but include you know, maybe the tendons and the legs and muscular movements, maybe even some kid psychology and try to you know, parameterize that. And you would ultimately get some representation of the up and down moment, up and down movements. And then you say, okay, now I want some climatological mean and you'd average over all those up and down movements. And you get, of course, the answer that you could just arrive at the equilibrium state very quickly by just saying, well, the kids are of equal weight and have a length and it's equal on both sides, so therefore we should get the average. So um, that's sort of the approach that I want to take here, suggesting as being a possible alternative. Um, this is a paper that came out in JGR last year with my co-authors um, Ian Glenn and Steve Kruger. I'll also be showing some work uh, with Nicolas Ferlet, he's at the University of Lille. He was my co-author also for the Mammatocumulus Luculus. But Ian Glenn is now at NOAA in Boulder and Steve Kruger is a professor at the University of Utah. So just to give some idea of sort of the flavor of how I want to approach this problem. And you know, there is only one paper that I've done on this work, so I'd very much appreciate your feedback on whether or not you think I'm totally out to lunch on this as I perhaps I am, but I would like to start first by quoting you know, the famous cloud physicist, John Dunn, who said uh, well, something similar, no cloud is an island entire of itself. Every cloud is a piece of a cloud field, a part of the troposphere. So I think this is one key thing, so that these clouds are interacting and we may want to represent how these clouds are interacting rather than treating, let's say, a single cloud as some sort of isolated system. There are large scale constraints. And then another thing is, well, we may want to choose, you know, appropriate uh, coordinate system. And, and of course, I'm, I'm not going to assume a spherical cloud because clouds aren't spherical, but the point here is just simply that if one were to represent a sphere in a coordinate system, you wouldn't choose a Cartesian coordinate system displaced from the center of the sphere, which is spherical coordinates. So, I mean, the choice of coordinate system matters. Now, typically, of course, for doing numerical modeling, the coordinate system is uh, 3D spatial coordinates, 
and time. And then we have you know, all the fields for energy and matter that get moved around within that system. So I'm going to suggest that there's a different coordinate system that dramatically simplifies the problem of looking at clouds in a way that's almost perhaps a bit astonishing, which is that we want to look at clouds statistically, removing time, look at PDFs, so a number distribution of clouds, and that the two variables that reduce this problem to something more simple are as the energy coordinate, the saturated static energy evaluated at cloud edge, and for the material coordinate, the perimeter at cloud edge. Now, this may seem rather unorthodox. It's not space and time. But I, I hope that I can satisfactorily explain why this might make some sense. So first off, the saturated static energy. It's like the moist static energy, but evaluated at the point of saturation. So the moist static energy, which is this thing up here, the saturated static energy, star represents saturation. It's just simply the summation of the sensible heat, the geopotential, and the latent heat at saturation. And then the cloud perimeter, well, that's just you know, some line around the cloud perimeter evaluated along some surface of constant saturated energy, which actually maps pretty well in the tropics to height, which is convenient. If you're not familiar with moist static energy and prefer equivalent potential temperature, that's fine. Um, I like energy rather than equivalent potential temperature, but there's often a difference between a meteorological background and a physics background. But either one's fine. It's just there's a simple transformation that goes between the two for equivalent potential temperature. And so, you know, the reason to tr think about these variables is that, well, the saturated static energy can be related to stability in a way that's very simple. And I'll, I'll express this. So if we had dH, dZ, then that's a measure of stability. If you prefer, usually, in, like Wallace and Hobbes say, it would be d theta e dz as a simple measure of the stability of the environment. And then why perimeter? Well, the thing about perimeter is perimeter is, I can't think of another. It's the only property that is shared between clouds and clear skies. I mean, if you think clear skies, you actually have a perimeter. And that's the same perimeter as the clouds have. So if we want to, the goal here is to relate cloud properties to something more simple, which is the bulk tropospheric values of some thermodynamic quantity, particularly the stability. And the perimeter is important because that is the point at which there are exchanges between the clouds and surrounding clear skies. The magnitude of the exchanges is just going to be related to the magnitude of this length. And we have, of course, we have perimeters down here, lots of little perimeters. We have a whole bunch of perimeters. So rather than focusing on area, which is the typical thing, here we'll focus on perimeter, and we'll focus on stability. Now, now the reason for doing this is that, of course, here we have a vertical motion. This is the moist front weissler frequency, buoyancy frequency of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is always jiggling up and down vertically, and has a frequency that's related to the stability. For exchanges going laterally, well, then there you have fixed diffusion laws go there, and those have their own time scales for exchanges going this way. And then we can try to connect those two because ultimately we have the continuity and we have circulations around cloud, cloud edge so that this time scale has to be similar to this time scale. And then we start to think about having a link between cloud perimeter and bulk tropospheric stability. So the question I want to raise here is, is there a simple link between a bulk thermodynamic property for the troposphere as a whole and cloud geometry? Yes. No, all clouds, any cloud. Any cloud could have a perimeter. But does this kind of cloud, I mean, can you use a larger area that you can think of? Because the size depends on the cloud itself. Yeah, so what, I mean, in a numerical model, so I'll be testing this in a numerical model, but in, in any situation, you have, you have to break up 
the atmosphere into layers, whether it's layers in saturated static energy or in height, and those do map onto each other. So you break it up into layers, and then you would, what I will end up doing is calculating the perimeter over all clouds in each layer, and then you can sum up all the perimeters eventually for all layers. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's just another 3D SHDOM illustration of the numerical model. And what I want to do is ask, what are the statistics for the, uh, that are in the Giga LES in this revised parameter space? Now, many people have studied them in space and time. What are they in this revised parameter space? Now, here's the first thing, is if we look at the value of the saturated static energy at cloud edge, it all seems to lie along this sort of bow feature right here. So do you see that there's kind of a bow shape right here? We have height here, saturated static energy. This is at cloud edge. And here we have log 10 frequency. So look, this is log 10. So it's dropping off quite quickly on either side here. So this is almost like a knife edge in saturated static energy. All the clouds, doesn't matter what kind of clouds, seem to lie along this line. Now above, this will be moist stability. So saturated static energy is increasing with height, that's stable. This is where the anvils are. Down here we have the scattered cumulus, it's unstable. So this is what leads to convection. Now there are some fascinating properties about this. The value of H star at cloud edge is equal to the cloud and clear sky domain mean value at that, at that height. So if we were to, oops, sorry. If we were to look, draw a line here, well, this line is actually the average at any given height for the domain as a whole at that height. So it's like cloud edge is like the fulcrum in that seesaw. So things are tipping back and forth, but the cloud edge has a value of saturated static energy that's equal to the mean for the entire domain at that height. So that's a pretty interesting property about cloud edge. That cloud edge seems like a very odd point to focus on, except it's the same as the mean for the entire domain at that height. Okay, but then even more so, where clouds are most common is where H star at cloud edge is equal to the whole tropospheric domain, domain for all heights. So if we average over the entire volume of the troposphere, then in the giga LES, it has this value right here. It's about 337.5 kilojoules per kilogram. Well, notice that the intersection point is right where the clouds are most common. That is the same height as the cirrus anvils. So the cirrus anvils are occupying a value of the saturated static energy that is equivalent to, this, to the average saturated static energy value for the troposphere as a whole. So that, I think, is a pretty remarkable simplification. Is that roughly clear? I'm going to take it one step further. If we look at the deviation, then this falls off on either side. And you notice, well, we get in, what do we call a serious sample? We call it an anvil. Well, an anvil has a particular shape. Well, it is dropping off from either side as some sort of perturbation from the tropospheric mean. So if you look at this, we get a drop off, I mean, on either side. I've distorted this image just to make it fit but the frequency of cloud occurrence drops off on either side of the mean. So that's, I think, interesting for the saturated static energy. Now, the other thing I was looking at was the perimeter. Well, what are the statistics for perimeter? Now, we look at this and we see, well, there's a ton of different perimeters out here. But I think the first thing that strikes, might strike you is that we have a lot of small clouds and we have a small number of big clouds. Well, let's say we just go to the height coordinate as a start. Now, this would be a picture that would be fairly familiar, which is that if we look at the frequency, which is that bar there, and we look versus height in kilometers on the left axis, and we have log 10 perimeter, I'm using lambda as a symbol for perimeter, along the x-axis, 
and we see something that would make be immediately familiar. We have a little peak of cumulus clouds down here. Most clouds, 97% are above six kilometers in the Giga LES. We still have a lot of small clouds up at high altitudes, but this is the only place we have the biggest clouds, which are, of course, the cirrus handfuls. But now I'm going to show what this looks like in a spatial coordinates I'd originally introduced of number, perimeter, and saturated static energy. And all that complexity of the Giga LES reduces to this shape, which is, I think, something extraordinarily simple. If we look at the Giga LES results, which is basically a representation of a tropical cloud field as complex as this, in a coordinate system of saturated static energy, perimeter, and number, then it's just this simple symmetric shape, which, you know, it's simple enough. Well, yeah, well just to summarize, here's the anvils, which are centered around the mean valley right here of about 338 kilojoules per kilogram. We have some scattered CU and cirrus up over here, but then there's this symmetry right here. So I think you would look at this and think of a deterministic calculation with 10 to the 18 flops that required tremendous supercomputing time to calculate the cloud field and say, well, statistically, that actually reduces to something that's just simple symmetry. Well, it turns out that this can be derived from first principles. So then the paper I mentioned, what I showed was that there is a fairly simple derivation. I mean, it took a lot of thinking to come with the derivation. It took, <laughs> took a while. But there is a derivation that reduces um, this shape and to a simple functional form, which is shown right here. So the functional form can be expressed as this equation right here. Now this is the tropospheric volume. This is a turbulent diffusivity that is a function of the spatial scale that's considered. And that actually Richardson made progress for, there's a four thirds power law there that's relevant to relate it to the molecular diffusivity. This is like, almost like a Boltzmann distribution, really a gamma distribution in terms of the delta H star, which is the departure from the mean. So delta H star could be this way or this way. It's always positive. So this is a mean H star. And then you have a perturbation either way. So that gives us an exponential distribution going this way. And then we have a power law with a negative two exponent going this way for the perimeter distribution. So wherever we are here, we get a power law. Wherever we are here or here, we get an exponential. And this is a combination. And all these are tied to the brunt Weissler frequency with respect to a moist adiabat, which is n. And that's about uh, 1 over 167 seconds in the model. So um, this led me to wonder about this question. Like, when do we get power laws and when do we get exponentials? Because we see both of these things throughout, the, throughout nature. Sometimes we see power laws, sometimes we see exponentials. Like, for example, in cloud size distributions, the clouds follow a power law, the droplets follow a power law, but then we get a Marshall-Palmer distribution for precipitation. Why do we get a switch from a power law to a negative exponential? And this is what I think is true, is that if we look within an isentropic layer, then finite available resources are competing for resources. They're the, any, any phenomenon is competing for available energy and matter. And within an isentropic layer, well, it's within an isentrope. We've already defined this as being a constant layer. But if there is a leak, as in, say, with precipitation, where we're losing something along the way, then we see a negative exponential. So that's, I think, a simple shorthand for when we get one versus the other. So back to Richardson's work. So uh, Richardson, so this is the th interesting thing about Richardson was that, you know, Richardson, he did this numerical work, this deterministic approach, but he was a devout pac pacifist. And as a pacifist, he tried to come up with some simple way of understanding war. Now, of course, you think of war as being a political structure, str struggle. You know, there's people involved, there's people die, all these things. But then he was able to reduce war by looking at 100 years of data to a simple power law. 
with a, with a slope of minus two. And this is just a particular case here where he looks at this, I, I just plot, chose this figure in particular because I love this banditry in Manchuoko during 1935. I mean, I, 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 I don't, love to have you know, some sort of figure in some paper that says that. But here's log 10, the number of raids per unit range of membership. So this is like our number. And then log 10, the number of bandits in the group. Okay, and then you know, here's what he showed here. It's a slope of minus 2.29. I will make a, um, a, a caution here that if one is plotting if one does it in discrete form, it's just number versus the quantity, then one gets a slope of minus one. But in continuous form, where it's number per thing, as like DND log, whatever, then you get a slope of minus two. So this is a, something to be aware of mathematically. So, you know, just tug in cheek, you know, we could replace that with the, you know, the uh, log. 10 the number of clouds and log 10 the perimeter of clouds and we would get you know a similar slope here and I, and I think this is this is instructive because wars are about competition right and these clouds are competing they are competing for air and so they are competing for perimeter because it is across the perimeter that there are exchanges of air but this minus 2 slope is everywhere i mean in your brains your neuronal firing is a minus 2 slope for the frequency of neuronal firing, the frequency of solar, um, so solar flares, uh, the intensity of earthquakes, income distributions follow this. Um, there's a, a ton of societal phenomena that follow the same power law. Wherever there's competition, we tend to see this sort of relationship. So these clouds are interacting. I don't think this is an accident that they follow this. So, you know, Richardson, he had this famous little uh, poem. It was based off uh, Jonathan Swift about fleas. You know, perhaps you know a big fleas of little fleas on their backs to bite them, and little fleas of lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. Maybe not. I thought everyone knew it, but then I said this to my class, and they were just shaking their heads. So perhaps just dating myself. But, you know, the, he was, you know, riffed on this and said, big worlds have lesser little worlds that feed on their velocity and little worlds have lesser worlds, and so on to viscosity. And this is you know, a little poem, but it's quite a big insight for understanding turbulence and you know, how turbulence leads to the Kolmogorov microscale. So I just, I don't know, this is pretty bad, but big clouds have little clouds that merge for their sustainment, and little clouds have bigger clouds that breathe in their detrainment. So the point here is that these clouds they're constantly changing size. They're constantly feeding off one another. And it's not like turbulence, which is like a one-way cascade. For clouds, it's a two-way cascade where you know, the big clouds are building off of little clouds. There's a lot of work that goes into this now. There's merging that goes on to make big clouds. But also, the big clouds ultimately dissipate and break up into little clouds, or they exhale um, air that uh, is available for little clouds to entrain and use for their growth. So, you know, just a little schematic here. Um, let's say we have a stream function around cloud edge where there's entrainment and detrainment. Well, air may rise along a moist adiabat, descend along a dry adiabat, but we end up having a disequilibrium across cloud edge that creates to a buoyancy difference, and that um, drives uh, flux, a diffusive flux across cloud edge in a closed circulation. But this air is ultimately available. These clouds are competing for the total circulation that's for the entire troposphere within some isentropic layer. So this is a bit like a fixed diffusion law. One looks at the drop, uh, rate of growth of a droplet and there's a similar equation that would be like the number of droplets, the radius of the droplet, and this would be uh, saturation vapor density difference. But here for clouds, it's a similar thing. We have a total current here, and that is constrained. And because it's constrained with an isotropic layer of fixed thickness, the clouds must compete for the number of clouds times the length of the cloud, the perimeter of the cloud. 
And what that leads into is the property of scale invariance, which is that the number times the perimeter is a constant. So we have a large number of small clouds, a small number of big clouds, but the number times the perimeter of the clouds within an isentropic layer is invariant of the size of the clouds. So that's scale invariance. So scale invariance is seen throughout nature. So then uh, to move on to uh, the exponential distribution, well, that's the other part of it. You know, if you remember in statistical mechanics, they introduce this term beta, which is in there. Well, what's this? How fast does it fall off? Well, then there's something interesting that shows up, which is how fast it falls off has a characteristic depth. And that characteristic depth can be related to the relative humidity of the domain. Yes? Uh, yeah, you can derive you can derive it. There's um, there's, there's similarity uh, theory. Similarity theory? No, it, probably you could do it from similarity theory. That's not how I did it. Um, I involved. I think it's really related to a principle of detailed balance. When there are exchanges, there have to be equal exchanges across all size bends. And then if there isn't loss from each size bend, then it leads mathematically to. Um, this property of scale invariance. I can't reproduce it off the top of my head right now, but it's in the paper. So I mean, here, you know, we think about some more general constraints here, that this departure can be related to the, um, the relative humidity of the domain. So then, you know, that's another simplification. So, you know, I, this is, Coming back now, that's the distributions. Just take the final step here, which is that the stability and the exchanges across cloud edge, I think, are linked through stability and perimeter. And there, if what we see is that if we integrate over all the clouds of all perimeters, then we could get a total perimeter of all layers. So this addresses the question, like if we break up the model into all layers, some of over all clouds, of all perimeters, of all layers in this 100 meter grid box, 100 meter cube grid cell size, then that equals a total perimeter. And that total perimeter can be related to the stability very simply. So if we take the total perimeter, multiply it by turbulent diffusivity, the 100 meter scale divided by the tropospheric volume, and that's equal to the front isolate frequency with respect to a moist adiabat. So this is very nice, I think, because then it says that, well, we could have one or the other, total cloud amount or the stability, and the two are linked through, well, these parameters are just known. Well, does that work? Well, with regards to the distributions, I didn't mention that the agreement between theory and model was 10%, 13% for the exponential distribution and 4% for the parallel. So the theory model very closely agree there. For total cloud perimeter, if we test this equation, if we calculate the total perimeter using the giga LES, tropospheric moist static stability as input, so we just put this from the giga LES, what do we get out for a prediction of the total cloud perimeter? Well, it's 52 kilometers per kilometer cubed. So that would be a density dividing by the tropospheric volume. The actual total perimeter summing over all clouds and all heights in the giga LES at the model resolution of 100 meters is 59 kilometers per kilometer cubed. So it's, it's very, very close. So this very simple theory reproduces all the complexity of the giga LES, at least statistically in terms of the distributions and also the total cloud amount to within, you know, it's a very close agreement. So I, I want to go on to, well, some other stuff, just some possible implications, but are there any questions before I go on? Yeah. How are you defining your cloud edge and how such it relates to your scale? Okay, so that's, that's a good question. So the cloud edge is the, um, defi in a model like the Giga Alice, it's very, um, uh, very, very easy. It's just where it reaches saturation, that's cloud edge. So it's a saturation adjustment scheme is what it's called. So if, let's say, ice crystals are slow to evaporate, 
then it might become something a bit fuzzy. But uh, in, t in the model, it's very easy to do. So that's just the definition of cloud edge. It's just where Q is equal to Q star. At cloud edge, the moist static energy is equal to the saturated static energy. So it's that simple. Anything else? Okay, so now this is the part like it's more exploratory. Um, I just wanna think about what are possible ways we could use this. And I think, you know, these, this coordinate system is pretty unfamiliar. We don't, we think in spatial coordinates, not in thermodynamic coordinates. So what, what do we do with this? And I think, you know, maybe one thing, just thinking about from a satellite perspective, well, here's beautiful epic pictures that we have all the time now. Could we use epic imagery to, well, we have a total perimeter there. We have total area even, or total perimeter. There's a fractal relationship between perimeter and area. Could we look at a picture like this and back out, let's say, a stability of the troposphere? I don't know, it's maybe something worth exploring because of course, stability of the troposphere is a basic climate parameter. Or, you know, I mean, what about constraining cloud climate feedbacks? I mean, is there a shorter way to do things now? I mean, essentially what we're doing is we're going straight to equilibrium here. I mean, it's a bit like there, there was a, a Berlin Marathon about a decade ago where um, one of the runners was uh, caught taking a shortcut. He found a shortcut in the Berlin Marathon so he could, after I think 10 miles, he just ran a few blocks over and went straight to the finish line. He was caught, not sweaty at all, raising his hands in victory, and then someone pointed out that he didn't look very sweaty. And you know, you know of course, it's perhaps that's cheating, but you know, if we can go straight to cloud climate feedbacks in a more direct way than doing numerical simulations, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's worth it. Well, here's just, I, I don't know what to do here, but I, I appreciate your input. Here's one idea here is, here's some polder, that's the French instrument, oxygen A-band retrievals of perimeter density over the Pacific during El Nino and La Niñas. And I'm very excited about these uh, retrievals because it's a passive uh, measurement of cloud spatial structure. And I think, you know, this has been work that Nicolas Ferlet has been doing with Anthony Davis in part. And, um, you know, there's some room to go with this, but the, you know, passive cloud structure is pretty interesting. So let's say we look at El Nino to La Nina sea surface, terri sea surface temperature variations and look at the perimeter distributions. Well, here's just the big one, the 2008-2009 El Nino. And we have go from La Nina to El Nino there. And then if we look at the cloud perimeter distributions over the tropics during that time period, well, this is, these are the distributions. We have a count per volume here. If we divide by the tropospheric volume, and this is the total perimeter, logarithmically spaced. And we get these results right here. And, um, well, this is nice. We see a power law of minus two. Actually, the way this is plotted, this is minus one. That's just because it was plotted in discrete form, not continuous form. So this is a power law of minus two, shown here. I know Brian would admonish me for not actually fitting the data and just putting a power law of minus two and pretending they're the same thing, but to me they look close enough. Sorry, Brian. So, I mean, this is what's predicted theoretically. So this is nice, is that the clouds display properties that are similar to what's predicted theoretically. But also notice that there isn't much variation between the El Nino and La Nina in terms of the distributions. And this is the thing about the total perimeter is constrained by the bulk tropospheric stability. And stability is a quantity that does not change very much. It's, it's a, well, the dry one is 0 0.01 per second, plus or minus a very little bit. So if the total perimeter scales as the, or the number scales as a Brunt-Weissler frequency, and this doesn't change much, then maybe we wouldn't expect much difference between El Nino and La Nina. Okay, well then how about this? What about climate sensitivity? So 
I'm intrigued by this comment by Dennis Hartman in an introduction to a paper, I think it was by Tapio Schneider in PNAS. He made the point that net cloud rated of forcing is near zero over the tropics. So the long wave and short wave roughly cancel, averaged over the tropics. So that leads to this suggestion that if cloud area changes, but cloud distributions don't, then there should be no cloud feedback. So we would have to get some change in the heights of these clouds or in how they move around. If there's just a change in the area, then maybe we wouldn't get a cloud feedback because it would just continue to cancel in the future. Well, I think one thing you see here is that, well, if it's possible to derive from first principles such very simple statistical distributions for the clouds, at least in a thermodynamic space, would you expect this to change in a warmer climate or would you expect this to be invariant? I think you might expect this to change a little bit as more latent heat is moved to the upper troposphere. This might increase a bit. So the total number of clouds might change, but maybe not their distributions. So the total number perimeter of clouds, which can relate to the area, might be, might change a bit as this increases a little bit. I would guess just a few percent based on some you know, just simple thermodynamics. So maybe it will be zero cloud feedback in the tropics, but that's just a tentative thing. Well then another aspect of this is that, you know, there's a hypothesis of what anvils will do. There's the fixed anvil temperature, which Dennis Hartman suggested, where due to the, well, clear sky rated of cooling, there's a transition from clear sky rated of cooling that's quite abrupt in the upper troposphere and that the cooling drops off very quickly and that leads to a point where vertical motions must also drop off and the vertical motions drop off suddenly then that suggests a point where there is uh, well, that's the point at which you would expect clouds to, cloud anvils to be, cho choose the altitude. It's at about 200 hectopascals. And he was making the argument that this is determined by the clausius clafferon equation and in, terms, in turn by the cloud temperature. So he made the prediction that clouds would move higher but maintain a fixed anvil temperature. And this would be a positive cloud feedback, which is a bit counterintuitive because the temperature is fixed, but if clouds move higher and all else stays the same, then that works out to be a positive cloud feedback. That was adjusted to be a proportional height and full temperature um, hypothesis that accounts for changing upper tropospheric static stability. Well, I wonder if there's a constraint here, but if we look at the clouds, just coming back to the original point, which is that the clouds seem to reside, the anvils seem to reside at this level that is equal to the saturated static energy mean value for the troposphere as a whole. So the question I think might be not, well, the question of what will happen to the anvils, which is a key part of the cloud climate feedback, may be changed to what will happen to the tropospheric mean saturated static energy. That may be another way to frame the question because that's where the anvils seem to be, is a lot at this mean value, this intersection point. So I just got these results this morning. I'm just gonna conclude with this from Ian Glenn. So this is very hastily prepared. But these are RCE simulations that, well, we only had eight hours to do the simulations. So they're at a thousand meters resolution. There, thousand meters resolution. This is a side view. And this is a top view. And well, maybe this is 305K right here for the sea surface temperature. This is 301K. Clouds move a bit higher. Maybe we get a bit few more clouds. If we look at the uh, saturated static energy, which is the dash curve here, well, it's a bit hard to see, but I think there's a little bit of a shift to higher, val higher altitudes. I think this is about the mean right there and you know, higher values of saturated static energy. So I don't know how to piece this together, but Ian Glenn helpfully suggested that we have a new hypothesis 
which is the fixed intervals of perimeter for fixed anvil perturbations in saturated static energy, or FIPFABs. So I, I've yet to process quite what he meant there, but I like the name. So just to conclude here, uh, so I think you know these clouds are social. They converse at the edge. This is the interaction point between clouds and clear skies that is a useful reference point. It's like the fulcrum in the seesaw that can be related to a troposphere, bulk tropospheric values because it is a shared quantity. That and then that these clouds are actually sharing air. We can't look at clouds individually and get anything meaningful out of, the, out of this. And so we should focus statistically on clouds, perhaps, instead of deterministically, but within a coordinate system that may not feel immediately natural, at least to get some of these simplifications. And that's saturated static energy and cloud perimeter. And you know, where this goes, I think, needs more work. And I, I, I'd love to explore this further. But the key things are that along within saturated isentropic layers, we get a parallel. The slope of minus two. But across isentropic layers, we get a Boltzmann distribution, a negative exponential. And that the scale height for that Boltzmann distribution drop off can be related to either the static stability actually or the bulk relative humidity. So that's simplifying. And then the total cloud amount seems to be constrained by the stability or actually the relative humidity. And then, you know, what satellite observations can, simulations can best be applied to further test and constrain this? This is something I would love to explore. And, and then I think perhaps, you know, a bit more provocatively, I would like to suggest that nowhere in these simplifications did aerosol cloud interactions come up or seem to need to or precipitation parameterizations. I mean, all my funding is in studying precipitation and snowflakes. Actually, I'd love to show some snowflakes and turbulence interactions. It's so I'm really excited about this. But th that's where my work is. But I'm not, I can't find a place to insert, let's say, a snowflake fall speed in a way that would change these statistical distributions. It's just perimeter and saturated static energy and stability. Unless the aerosols are changing, perhaps you can imagine perhaps black carbon changing the stability of the troposphere. Maybe that would be an avenue for doing it, but I don't see aerosol cloud interactions doing it because somehow that cloud field is going to have to find a way through interactions between clouds to satisfy these properties like scale and variance. And if they don't, well, they'll find a way to do it. The cloud is one cloud is too much perimeter. Well, then they'll breathe through detrainment and provide air for all the small clouds to compensate and catch up. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Well, uh, thanks very much, Tim. Uh, what, what a provocative talk. Um, so I'm supposed to have a microphone because we're actually being recorded. So uh, it, it's up here. You see a microphone up there? Oh, yeah, cool. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so we're going to start with some order here. Let's just start with some. I have two questions. When you sum over the parameters, when the cloud is overlapped, so you sum over each layer, is that yeah, true? Yeah, in the model, okay. yeah, you don't care that there's overlap. You're just summing over every layer. Oh, okay. And so, I mean, so the way to think about it is that in each layer, the, the along in the moist isentropic layer, the clouds are competing. I think they have enough time to compete within that layer without considering interactions between layers. I'm not sure that's totally true. Is that true? But nonetheless, that's, that's what we're doing, is we're, we're just summing up over layers. Yeah, and my second question is related to cloud types, because different cloud types may have different way to exchange with its environment. So how these, uh, I mean, can be represented in your simplified model here? Well, it's not. Uh, 
on, I'm not sure, sorry, I'm not sure I see why it would well, for need example, to be represented. So all, I mean, all clouds of whatever type have an edge. Yeah, for example. And they interact with their environment let through me make that a edge. Si simply way, simplify way. So say in the future of warming climate, can your model predict the ratio of convective cloud and stratiform cloud, the ratio will be different or not? Okay, so that's, that's reasonable. Well, what do you mean by convective and stratiform is perhaps part of the definition. And I think uh, perhaps there's a, like a perimeter to area ratio that is implicit in that definition. Is that possible? So if one has a perimeter to area ratio that's implicit in your definition of stratiform clouds versus convective clouds, well then sure, there's, no, there's, there's I don't think there's any problem in doing that. Um, however, I think the theory is talking about a continuum. There's always a continuum, so imposing some arbitrary separation might feel a little bit unnatural because of course there's plenty of clouds that are you know, like stratocumulus that you know, by definition are somewhere in between. Thanks for a nice talk. So does your model predict the increase of amber clouds when the surface is warmer? Because a lot of cloud resolving models shows the amber actually decreases when well, the okay. surface is Okay, so warm. That's, that's the thing is that, the, yes, the model does predict an increase in perimeter density strictly. So that's <laughs> slightly harder to think about. But yes, it would predict an increase in perimeter, I think, if you assume it is fixed tropospheric volume, which may be not quite right. But for fixed tropospheric volume, then it would, well, it's, it's natural to predict that the atmosphere will become more stable in a warmer climate. That's a fairly easy thing to calculate for a warmer sea surface temperature because there's more latent heat to be evicted to the upper troposphere. And one can make a fairly simple calculation using the gaseous Clapeyron equation. I think that leads to, it's, it's in the paper, a simple calculation, but um, it was like a few percent per Kelvin in the increase in the area of the clouds. Now, I understand that that is opposite of what most GCMs are predicting now, mm -hmm. which is a reduction of cloud handle. Yeah. Now, one thing I wonder is whether or not this is just a limitation of the models because they can't resolve all the smaller clouds, of course, mm -hmm. that I'm predicting. Now I'm saying that the total cloud perimeter will increase. I don't necessarily know that that's the anvils. There could be a lot of small clouds that are showing up as well. And those may not be actually represented at all in the GCM parameterization is that scattered cirrus that shows up in the death throes of the cirrus anvil's lifetime. So I, I, I'd love to explore that further because I agree that that is a conflict between what this theory suggests and what the most models suggest. Yes, yes, thank you. So we have Mark and then Brian. Okay, so you showed um, A-band estimates, so we have satellite observations So you're saying you can retrieve this perimeter parameter from, and you also talked about feedbacks, but could you comment about how things like cloud overlap would affect that? And if you've decided, if you're running sort of like radiative transfer simulators to see whether your observed estimate of this thing is biased due to, say, cloud overlap. So you're talking about in the satellite observations? Yeah, you're talking about trying to retrieve these parameters. And mm -hmm. if you're looking at a multi-layer system passively, you're going to miss a lot of perimeter of the clouds, right? Yeah, sure. So could you comment on what you've thought about with that and uh, what, how that might link to your estimates of feedbacks? Okay, I wanna show you something. Well, Brian and I were talking about this. So this is an interior of a cloud measured using a, an instrument, the ho uh, holodeck that was developed at Michigan Tech University. This is at scales of millimeters. Where's the cloud overlap here? I mean, there is cloud overlap at all scales, okay? You know, even at the very, very smallest scales, there is cloud overlap. Or I could go to something like this. These are snowflakes from an instrument I developed, pictures. Well, I see overlap there. I see overlap there. 
There is overlap at all scales. Now, an interesting property of the troposphere is that the spread in saturated static energy is if we go about, well, okay, this, this, figure, this figure will do. The spread in saturated static energy here is what, about 10 kilojoules per kilogram? And the average is, well, about what, 338 kilojoules per kilogram? So effectively, the entire troposphere can be treated as a moist isentrope. I, and I, I understand that that may feel unnatural to think about it, but if one does delta H star over H star bar, then that's only about 3%. So I'm not totally sure about this, but I think my answer is, is that the cloud overlap, well, no, you're just looking down at an isentrope. And so whatever you see is something that should be representative of uh, the troposphere. And that one should, from a thermodynamic standpoint, and this is a thermodynamically based theory, uh, should be acceptable. I'm not totally convinced by that because I, I've thought about that question. Brian and I were talking about it on the way back from the airport, from the, here from the airport. And uh, I agree that it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. But I think the cloud overlap, it, yeah, it's at all scales. So I mean, what do you do? Thanks. Thanks, great talk. Um, my, my question is actually very similar to what Mark just asked. Um, I was just curious about how you retrieve the parameter for, from the polar measurements. Um, Anthony Davis would probably be the best person to ask, answer that. What's Nicola doing there? Top height. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is cloud uh, top height and yeah. cloud top thickness. The product, the product is cloud top yeah. height. So it's two bands. Yes, yes, just two bands. So he doesn't, can't do any more than that. Um, so he, that gives him a surface. And, you know, from a surface, you can take you know, slices and measure perimeters if you want. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I don't, have you tried that? Well, that's what we've done. That's June. Okay. Well, no, actually, mm -hmm. I think in, in this case, all that was done was just look down and pulled her. It wasn't, it wasn't actually setting up the structure of it. It was much more simple than that. But I, I think the intriguing thing to do is to look at, I don't have it here. He's done this wonderful retrieval, some marvelous retrievals of a hurricane, looking at the banded structures of hurricanes by using this technique. And the idea is, yes, you get cloud top height using this technique, and, but then also using some of the theory you developed, I think he's getting some measure of cloud thickness for every single pixel. That's correct, but I don't see that happening here. In, not in this representation. Uh, I think that's what he's doing. Okay. Well, I'll have to read the paper. Yeah. It's, his, it's, it's his work with Marie de Mons. You've, you've shown these universal scale laws seem to hold across a wide range of parameters, parameters. and you also showed the, sense of, or the dependence, very simple dependence on these mean properties of the saturated energy. Why not just uh, parameterize your cloud based on that quantity alone because you seem to have the pr radiative properties appropriately represented by them? I didn't, didn't quite understand. Well, you can turn this around. If you know the mean stat saturated energy, can't you say something about the cloud field that's associated with it? Well, yeah, I guess I didn't say that explicitly enough. But the, the point here is to have a point value. We could take a point value of the stability. Uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but we could take this. This is something you could get from, I don't know, some just free analysis yeah. data, right? Well, then you have this. And from that and the equation I derived for the distribution, one could unravel this. So for parameterization, I mean, that's really, I, yeah, sorry, I should have stated that more explicitly, but that, you know, the GCM can do this. Yeah, and that's basically my question. And then the GCM does this, and then it can get the total perimeter without any effort, and then this without any effort, too. And one has a statistical distribution. Now, then one doesn't have this 
with respect to height, but I think there's actually, one can do this, there's some, um, oh, sorry, why am I spacing on the name? Um, the, the, sorry, the guy who did the work on showing that how evaporation controls determines why you have anvils, more anvils than more, and then cumulus clouds slow down. So if we just looked at this figure right here, the question I did not address, but I suspect the classic Clapeyron equation would simply explain, is that, you know, this is symmetric, the average, but it doesn't explain why it's all clouds up here. Like strictly thermodynamically, you would expect equal distribution here and here, but that's not what you see. And the explanation that's been given is that clouds just evaporate much more quickly down here. And that's a function of the clausius clapeyron equation. In fact, if you compare the temperatures here and the frequencies and do clausius clapeyron equation for the saturated mixing ratio, it works out about right. So then I think you might be able to do a complete picture, except I don't have an explanation for this bow shape yet. So there are there's places further to go, but you are, you're totally right. That's where I imagine parameterization leading. Okay, we're running over, so let's just take one more question. So my question is a little bit on a tangent. Um, I spent most of your talk thinking about, um, what about, oh, sorry, Thanks. that you're talking about the chaos of cloud variability, and how is that variability, how is the, I mean, you have some constraints on this variability for the clouds, but those types, so why, is, why are the cloud chaos so different from, say, momentum chaos or energy chaos that you have these constraints? Have you thought about what's unique about this? I think what it is is you found the property of clouds, which is the, the perimeter, and the perimeter is constrained by the clausius clapeyron and that limits the amount of chaos that that parameter can have but there could be other properties of the cloud, like the, ma the mass of water in the cloud that doesn't have that constraint, and it can go all over the place. Well, with, yeah, with I climate. think that's, and people model, uh, there's a general approach is to model the, the water in the cloud, which is complicated, and then what else gets into precipitation parameterizations. But the point is, is that the perimeter is directly linked to flux fl uh, fluxes of mass. And, that is a constrained quantity. If we constrain the total flux of mass in the system at steady state, then the perimeter is constrained. It's just an easier parimeter to constrain. But the flux is all at steady state. Well, for a climate condition, we would assume that they are. Of a global ensemble. Of a global ensemble, yes. But that global ensemble might be defined as the tropics. So, in terms of like reality, you know, of course, over shorter time scales, everything interacts with everything else. So the tropics interact with mid-latitudes and there's all synoptic waves that come through and that makes this more complicated. But imagine a GCN grid box. The implicit assumption is that there's some sort of steady state within that grid box over the time scale that's being calculated. Well, okay, fine but we have to approach this problem somehow, okay? So it's a question of what is the time scale of interest? And if it's a climatology, it's a longer time scale and a larger spatial scale. So we do some averaging and there, there are fundamental properties like the mass flux that are constrained. And that can ultimately be related to things like clear sky, top of the atmosphere rated cooling. And water vapor concentrations and greenhouse gases. Well, thanks everybody for sticking around. Let's thank Tim one more time. Thanks for